Dear people, will you please open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter 4. <clears throat> the book of Colossians, chapter 4. We will be focusing on the fourth chapter, verses 2, 3, and 4, and they read thusly. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Praying at all the same, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned and that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Let's once again seek our God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to a section here where Paul is asking for prayer of the brethren who he sent this letter. We come, O oh God, also asking for prayer that you would even guide us. Paul wanted to be sure that he was preaching and teaching that which you had given him. We want to be sure, as we would look to preaching this morning, that we would see that which you are giving to us. So, Father, we pray, bless the preaching of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we continue our studies in the book of Colossians, we are in the last section of the letter that is focused on motivations and principles of the Christian life. Again, this section is divided into four major sections. The first one, abandoning the, the devices of the old life, which is in chap, chapter 3, verses 5 to 11, cultivating the virtues of the new life, in uh, verse chapter 3, 12 to 17, strengthening family relationships in chapter 3, 18 to verse to chapter four, verse one. And now we pick up another aspect and the fifth one is performing religious duties. And we will find that in a chapter four, verses two and down to verse six. This morning we will pick up on that first section, performing religious duties. We'll be looking at verses two, three, and four this morning. Now, Paul comes, as Paul comes to the close of the letter, he gives some closing admonition to the church. And those closing admonitions are given to us also in all the churches until Jesus comes. He begins with the importance of prayer. It has been said that prayer is the most important weapon of the Christian's arsenal. Prayer is the means by which we obtain physical and spiritual strength for the Christian life, the instrument for confession of sin, and the means by which we believe the believer pours out his heart to God in adoration and praise. The Christian life is supported by and advanced by prayer. <coughs> Therefore, Paul now moves to this important aspect of prayer. Now, some of the commentators believe that in this second verse in chapter four, Paul now is going on to a whole new subject, which is disconnected from what we have looked at in the third chapter altogether, and especially verses 18 to 25. But others say that the prayer is important in order to biblically carry out the rules of relationship in the Christian household, which we saw from 18 down to 25, and here, and the uh, direction given with all others of the accomplishment of fervent prayer. And Paul indicated throughout his very bloody itself that we must be those who are praying. Therefore, Paul's admonition to pr on prayer includes all aspects of the Christian life including how to glorify God in the home. Remember what Paul was saying in verses 18 and down to 
verse 1 in chapter 4, wives and husbands and how they should live, children and parents, how they should live. And also, slaves are either servants in that household. Paul is speaking to all who have been saved and brought into the, the very economy of Christ, new in Christ Jesus. So now when we pick up in verse 2, Paul is saying an important, important issue must be looked at, and that is the urgency of prayer. In the three verses, there are two points the apostle is making. The first point is the urgency of personal prayer. And that is in verse two. And then a second point, prayer for Paul and his ministry in verses three and four. four. As we pick up in the first one, the urgency of a personal prayer, notice how the, uh, the apostle lays it out. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Paul says three things in here. He goes to those particular things in prayer. He says, first of all, devote yourself to prayer. Devote, the word that we have here, means to tarry. Remain somewhere, to continue, to persevere. Attachment to it, steadfastness in it, standing strong and not being moved. It means to endure also. In Acts 1 and 14, before how the church come to birth in the early part of the, the book of Acts in 13, verse 14a, it says, these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. And the chapter two of Acts, as it goes on, the day of Pentecost, and it says in verse 46, day by day, the believers, they were continuing with one mind in the temple. They were stayed together, they tarried, they were devoted to one another. Nothing could move them. And then in Acts chapter six and verse four, in that section where the concern of the, of the, uh, the the apostles and how they would take care of the church and the needs of the church. And so they told the people to look out from among them and find men who could do this work. And it says in six and four, but we must devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word, speaking of the apostles and the growth of the church. And they knew at that time, it must be that prayer should be the thing that they should hold on to. Paul says in Romans 12 and 12, he says about how the Christian should be rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Paul is telling the church the kind of de dedication they must have for one another. In our passage, it, it has the sense of per persistence and fervor. In other words, prayer should be real. Prayer should come from the heart. It should meet, it should even speak and go up to God. This kind of devotion in prayer comes by discipline, <coughs> practice over time, yes. and a commitment that prayer is the central importance for the Christian life. Brethren, if you come to the point where we think we can live without prayer, something's wrong. Something is wrong. Now we would truly say quickly, Lord, we don't pray as we ought. But we we'll never say we don't pray at all. And there are people who go about and they think they are praying, but they're doing nothing but, as it were, commanding God to do the things that they want to do. Oh, that's not what we see in the Bible. And so here we find that this is what we should be doing. Paul is saying when he says devote yourselves, he's saying now be persistent, be on it. What he's saying is the kind of devotion in prayer comes by discipline, practice over time, and commitment to prayer. That prayer is the central importance of the church, as mentioned. Paul says this, and he tells us, even in Ephesians chapter 6, the kind of devotion in prayer comes from the Holy Spirit. It is not us trying to muster up as much as we can in ourselves. It is a giving ourselves to the Holy Spirit and that he can use us. And Paul says it this way in 16 and 18, uh, chapter 6 and 18 of Ephesians. With all prayer and petition, 
pray at all times in the spirit. Not having some things come rolling out your mind and you don't know where it come from, but giving the Holy Spirit that place where he can take control of us in our bodies and our minds and that we will bring forth that which will be to the glory of God. What we have seen in these texts is there is the idea of persistent and fervor. Jesus displays this attitude in the parable of the unjust judge. And I thought that was something we should be able to look at. Turn over to Luke chapter 18. And notice how Jesus in this very section and what he's, he's speaking of. Luke chapter 18. I think I got the wrong chapter here, folks. But anyway, you know the text, right? He's here, this lady, she comes to the judge and she asking the judge to plead, to plead her case, be the one who would come for her. And she come and he um, basically showing, I don't have any time for this lady, you know, I, I'm, I'm just gonna ignore her. And, but you know, she keeps on. And then he comes to the point where he says, he says to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain, I'm sorry. Actually, I'm missing, I'm jumping ahead of myself here, people, be with, stay with me. Uh, and it, it basically he says here, it's Luke 18, one and eight. Okay, that's where it is. How come somebody wouldn't hollow that out to me? <laughs> she said she did. <laughs> now here, now this one, he says in verse one, how, no, now he was telling them a parable to show that all, at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. And then he gives this parable of the ju unjust judge. And we know what it says. In that certain city, he was there, and the widow came, and the widow came, and she asking for uh, her a place or her need to be listened to. And in verse 5, he said, Yet because of his, this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. Do you almost wear the Lord out in prayer? Do you go to him and keep continually insist in them? And the book Jesus says this. He says, uh, and the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will I, now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cried to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? Jesus says, if an unjust judge is going to come, and because he is tired of the one who's coming and give her what she needs, you have a God who listens to you, and he will give you what is needed. And that way, you won't have to worry about him. And therefore, Jesus is saying, this is the very thing you must see. So Paul, in his first area here, he says, devote, devote yourself to prayer. But he goes on. That in itself would seem to be enough, wouldn't it, brethren? But he goes on, keeping alert in it. Keeping alert. Alert here <coughs> to arise, to watch, to refrain from sleeping. Being awake and alert, it has the idea of paying attention. Here we have Matthew 26 and 38. Then Jesus there, he was in the garden. He had his disciples there. And he goes, and then he comes back to the disciples. And then he says to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Jesus was telling his disciples that they ought to keep watch. In other words, stay alert. Make sure you're there. Don't fall asleep. Jesus goes and he prays. He comes back. And he cries out again. He says, you couldn't even keep watch. He says in verse 40, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. Hear what the Lord is saying. 
he tells those those men there this word was the has the idea of praying paying attention to God's revelation or to the knowledge of salvation. It is to keep you for everything pointed upon God and what he's doing. It's not to just ramble some stuff up to God and call that prayer. No, he says, keeping alert, understanding, knowing where you ought to go. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 6, So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. The apostle Paul is saying that this is what he's looking at, and this is what we should do. The two words carry the idea of threatening danger, and that the alertness with Consciousness, earnestness will keep one from the danger. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 5 and 8. Be so of a sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Peter is saying there, we as those who are the believers of Christ Jesus, we should make sure that we know that we have an adversary. That adversary is the devil. And believers, brothers, don't think that because you believe in Christ, the devil is not going to try to get you. Don't think that he's going to look at us and say, oh, those are Christians. I don't have any way. No. What he thinks is that he can get in. He wants to prove that Christ is not who he is or Christ does not have the power or Christ will not obtain all that he promised and the reason why he came into the world. So Peter can say, be of a sober spirit. Be on alert. Why? Your adversary, the devil. Have you ever thought about that? You don't think about it too often, do you? That the devil is trying his best to make me fall. The devil is looking for ways to trip me up. And sometimes it comes when, when basically a, 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 member, a family member may say something to us. And the way we snap back at him may be the very thing that the devil says, ha ha, got him. So that's why Peter can say, be of a sober spirit. Be on the alert. Because we got an enemy that's prowling around and he's looking to devour. So Paul says here, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it. But the third thing he says, he speaks about an attitude of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, the word thankfulness, gratefulness, gratitude to God. The word means to act from a sense of thankfulness for what has been given or received from God. This looks at God's blessed love and care for us, which will cause us to live in a constant attitude of thankfulness. We're not those who receive from God and say, you know, all we got to do is take what he has to give us and that's it. No, we should be those who are being thankful. And sometimes in the situations that we're in, it may be hard to be thankful, but we must do it. In this very letter of Colossians, it is filled with thanksgiving to God. I could run down some of it in chapter 1 and, and verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Chapter 2, verse 7. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your, fa in, in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. And that's thanksgiving. And in chapter three, in verse 15, he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Paul is saying it over and over again. Verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Prayer is something that Paul is saying that has these three elements to him. And these three elements are truly that which we need. And these are three elements that we need to do and we need to find ourselves with. But the question is, how can anyone be giving thanks to God? 
Well, Paul has laid that all out for us in this entire book up this point, and he says there should be this thanksgiving, this attitude. But the thanksgiving that molds the believer's heart and attitude is his present status in grace. It has to start there. Who are we in Christ Jesus? Are we just a religious person? We hear that it's a good thing to go to church on Sunday? Or have we been changed? Is there something real about us? Something different about us? And I think that Thanksgiving comes to the reality of who we are. Dead to the world in its power. Alive to God in Christ with sins forgiven and headed for the glorious future of God with Jesus Christ forever. These truths are produced thanksgiving in the heart of the believer. The idea of thanksgiving, thankfulness is what will develop prayer and an alertness in the believer's life. So you see, we don't take what God gives us and say, okay, that's fine, I'm gonna use this. We are humbly always showing, as Paul says here, he tells the brethren here, as he finish off even this section, he's speaking of the home itself, that household and how, how it must work out. He says, you're not gonna work out the way you ought to if you do not devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it and with thanksgiving. The next two verses is they quickly, they go off and Paul was saying what he's saying here. He asks prayer for himself. Notice in verse three, praying at the same time for us as well, that God would open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mysteries of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in what and the way I ought to speak. Now, Paul says three quick things, and I don't think we're gonna have to spend much time here. He says, praying at the same time for us. Paul is saying now, as you are praying in the midst of the church, you're praying for yourself in your family situation and praying for everything that I've actually played on you. And you are a praying people. Paul can say that if we go back to the beginning of the book, all their trust was in Christ Jesus and what Jesus has done. So he know they were praying. And so he said, as you're praying, now at the same time, even when you receive this letter from me, devote yourself to prayer. Paul said, also pray for me. The petition that Paul desires that the church pray for him is shown in three areas. And again, I don't have to do much in opening it up. He says, first of all, that God will open up to us a door for the road, for the word. Paul is saying now, here he is. Remember, Paul is sitting in prison. He's in prison at this time writing this letter. He writes the letter that God would open up a door. You see, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up a door for the word. Paul is sitting in prison. Paul is, don't know if he's gonna get out or not. Paul don't know what he's gonna do, but Paul knows he has a ministry there in prison while he's writing this letter and other letters to the other churches, that God would help him that God will open up to us a door for the word. Paul is requesting prayer for the guidance of God on his ministry, that he would help, that God would guide him. And we, we, and I, we know and understand, as Paul writes to the Colossian church, he's writing, writing to Grace Reformed Baptist Church. He's writing for other, all the churches that exist now, true churches in Christ right now. This letter is to us. And Paul is saying that all he would do, that God would open a door as the word of God would go through. There would be doors open up for the word, word to go on. How is the word of God opening up doors? One is saved and he or she may be saved. Others are saved and what they do, they go and take the word out to other people. Churches are brought to birth and then there it is. The church is going more. Paul says that God would open up a door for the word. Paul is requesting that the world be able to run and have free course. 
His second thing he says, so that we may speak forth the mysteries of Christ. And Paul is saying, the prayer is here, and the word we're going to go here is that those things which are needed for the very truth of God, which is so beyond human reasoning. Nobody can pick up a book and say that they can read this and they know everything about God. You can't until God gives us the spirit to understand that. And so when he says an open door, that God would really go before him and he would begin to open up the hearts of sinners and they would begin to hear the mysteries of Christ, the reality of salvation and how the world is coming to an end. Christ is going to come back. But God, Christ made that clear. He said he's going to come back and he's going to have all the world before him. And if some are going to be on one side, he said, enter into that which was prepared for you. And the others, into outer darkness. Paul says, pray that God would help me to be able to open up this truth, which are hidden truths right now. Mystery is not something mysterious. Paul picked that up early on in this book, but is that which are hidden from folk? You don't understand it. You can't without the Holy Spirit so that we may speak for, forth the mysteries of Christ. Paul knows that God will make his desires clear through prayer. Paul is saying he looked to prayer and it's prayer that he turns to. The second, third thing he says, and that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. You see, the Apostle Paul, you probably would ask Paul, why do you think you not a help the way you to speak? Look at you, the books that you've written. Look at all the things you said, you know. Paul knew, no matter what I've done to this point, I need Christ, I need the Holy Spirit to guide me in what I do even after this. That's like saying to you and I, yes, God helped us yesterday. And maybe in some way, out of some particular thing, using the truth of the word of God and helped us out of that. But we don't hold back on that only, do we? We look for God to give us more understanding and truth and clarity how to use the things we ought to. This is what Paul is saying. Paul adds, know God's, he know God's guidance. He understand God's guidance. He know God's desire also needs something else. Clear preaching. And that's what he's saying, that I may Make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Paul can say, well, you know what? I read that passage and I read this passage. So I don't have to do anything. I just get up and try to wing it. Paul says, no, I want God with me. God speaking through me. God making it clear what I should pray, say to the people. Paul took this serious at this point. So as Paul is doing this, he's saying these particular things. And Paul now gives this all to us. And as we look at this this morning, you and I have to even say, how does that fit for us today? How does that help us this day? And this is what the applications would do for us. First of all, we must see and understand. Prayer is very important to the life of the Christian. Prayer is very important to the life of the Christian. Dear people, we mustn't be like some where we'll pray hit and miss. I was supposed to have my devotions this morning, but I didn't have them. Uh-uh. We are not going to be, as it were, built up to face the world. If we say we go put this off to the next week, oh, I'll give it the next week. Now there's times sometimes when things may come on us and we may find ourselves, oh, th this happened, that happened, and it could be legitimate things. It could be problems that come. And I can't spend the time in prayer that I ought or would desire to do. But we can do just like Nehemiah when he came before the king. He could just, Lord, help me. If that's real and from the heart, that God knows it and God will help us in it. We may not have to even say too many words. Remember Peter, he was on the water and he was falling out when he saw, I can come out. You sure I can do this? You just tell me to come. I'll walk on the water. He stepped out, he looked down. Oh, 
starts sinking. God, Christ had to grab him up. Prayer is very important to the Christian life. It is the proof that there is real spiritual life. It is the truth. It is the very thing that shows who we are. There are people, there are a lot of people saying some so-called prayers in this world. There are a lot of people who have some kind of religion that they are supposedly praying to their God. There are those who pray to Buddha, to Allah, to everything else going there. Those praying to statues. But that, oh, that's all wrong. That's nothing. And we can read in the scriptures where some that they were praying to those false gods, beating themselves and causing all kinds of wounds on themselves, to asking their God to come down and do something. So prayer is spiritual. Prayer is the help that we receive from the Holy Spirit. And this is the first thing we have to see. Praying this way is the Spirit's help in prayer. We have to understand prayer is important, but prayer is proof that the real spiritual life is in us also. How do you pray? Do you find yourself being drawn in, out of the words as the world, as it were, away from all things that are around you, and you find yourself coming into the very presence of God? aided by the Spirit to speak to God, to lay your petitions before Him what is needed at that particular time. That's the first thing we can see. Prayer is very important to the Christian life. Secondly, the attitude one has about prayer tells a lot about his Christian walk. Are we satisfied with a quick, unthought out, or cold-hearted prayer to God? Well, that's the kind of life we have. It's a weak, cold life. If we're satisfied with that, we need to do something. We need to come to the point where Paul could say here that we have find ourselves devoted to prayer, keeping alert in it, and, and, and even with thanksgiving. And this is what the third thing is. is thanksgiving is the proof of true salvation. It's the proof. What are we thanking God for? And here Paul is not talking about the commodities of this world, this life, the things we have. Yes, we thank God for that, but through true thanksgiving goes on and it focuses upon who we are in Jesus Christ. This kind of prayer can only exist if there is real salvation. Thanksgiving focuses on reality. It focuses upon truth and what is known and experienced in the, uh, in other words, what is real. A lot of people, they got a religion, but it's fuzzy. They can't grasp it. It slips away from them. That's not the case with the Christian religion. Christ and what he did, he said, is real. And it is real. And we know that it is real because a gift has been given. Jesus is our blessed Savior. An action has been taken. Christ died for us. Amen. A word spoken. God and Jesus speak to us in the Bible. Dear people, this is not old and dusty. This is new and powerful to us right now, as just as it was when Paul first wrote these, this book to the Colossians. It's fresh, it's for us right now, and it helps us, and it causes us to see and understand what God would have for us. Paul, I believe he probably knew that writing to the church would be something that will be now used for all creations until Christ should return again. But if he didn't, what a blessed gift he gives to not only that church, for all the churches and every true Christian until Christ comes again. And also, Thanksgiving is focused on reality and truth realized. We have that truth and it is realized, which is salvation is sure and true. Jesus came to save his people and Jesus is saving his people. There are a lot of people even calling themselves Christian that don't know anything about true salvation. Listen to a man on the radio this morning. 
he was talking about a whole new way of looking at the Bible and talking about this is the way. And he threw out all the truth that stands Jesus powerful among all. He put it to the point where now you as a human being, you can just direct to Christ what you want done. And he has to do it. That's not the God of the Bible. That's not the Christ who went to the cross for his people. He knew we couldn't do one thing. We were hopeless, helpless. He had to come and take our place. We were going to die an eternal death, never to see life once again, in total cast away from God. But Christ came and died for us took our sins upon him, went to the cross, and a real salvation is given to us. Save is really what it means. It means we have now been grasped by God through the work of his son. And so therefore, you, do you believe that's something to be thankful for? If we just think about that sometimes, and I know it's been the way of the past of Christians. Yes, things are hard. Even this body of mine, is, oh, it seems like I'm gonna fall apart. But then you could say, oh, the day is coming when this old body will be laid down and I'll be new in heaven with Christ for all eternity. Isn't that something to be thankful for? Yes. The body has been riddled with sin when Adam went against God in the garden. And from that point on, sin entered into man. And what happens there? We, these bodies are falling apart because of sin. And it's not because maybe you get some sin, particular sin, but the effects of sin destroys the human race and even destroyed the human body. But salvation brings it to that place where now it's in Christ Jesus, and Christ Jesus the one who we live for. So these are the things. Thanksgiving is the proof of true salvation. We know Christ Jesus was our blessed Savior. We know the action that he took in order to save us. We know that God speaks to us in the Bible, and we know that salvation is real. How is it that Paul can give the, this exhortation to the church? Because of all the facts he has made clear in this letter concerning the salvation of the brethren. If you go back and you read to Colossians, he's made it clear there. A fourth point I have this morning. How do you pray? That's a question we should have before ourselves. Anytime we come to any part of scriptures, we should make that particular thing, whether it be a question or whether it be just a, a soul searching, we should make that come to us. How do I pray? How or well, are your prayers a religious act? Am I just going through something just to say I prayed? Am I praying because I have some idea about a God somewhere? A lot of people grow up, they know and they hear of God. Before I got saved as a young man, a young boy, I believed God existed. And there were some times I probably prayed to this God, but I prayed for what I wanted. I didn't pray in the way Paul is saying here, looking at God and who he is. No one can be truly thankful, as Paul is speaking of here, for an idea or philosophy. Paul even spoke to these brothers in this letter here that they make sure they don't get caught up in it. Chapter 2 and verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy. An empty deception, according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. And there's a lot of that out there. We have to be careful who we listen to, because so many of them are trying now to grab it. And this is the way the devil does his act. He comes in liking or looking as if he was someone on our side. He comes in as a preacher. And he says, 
I'm going to preach the truth to you. And as you listen to him, you start scratching your head. Where did this stuff come from? I didn't see that in the Bible. Well, it's because it's not there. True prayer can only come from a heart that knows the truth of Jesus Christ and God's saving grace to sinners. That's where true prayer comes from. Oh yeah, we will grow in prayer and we must see ourselves doing that. And then the final message here or application, let us endeavor to pray in the way taught in this very passage right here. Paul says in verse two, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. Let us be at this point, let's say, the Lord God, you're speaking to me. My prayer life, if it's been a little shabby, been hit and miss, I'm going to devote myself to prayer. I'm going to make it that there are times when I'm going to be praying to you, Lord, Lord God. Nothing is going to take me from that schedule of prayer. I'm going to fix that so I can truly give my heart to you. But and the other thing he says here about the keeping alert in it. We come into the place where we understand that there's all the temps of the devil that are coming around, trying to bombard us and trying to throw us apart, but keep ourselves firm and fitted <coughs> on God's truth, alert in prayer, praying with thanksgiving. Oh, brother, knowing that nothing that we have come to us because we merit it. God didn't look at you or me and say, you know, they're pretty good people. I'm going to save them. No, he said, they're wretched just like the rest. They're on their way to hell. And if I don't come and save them, there's no hope for them. But I, but they were given to me in eternity past. They are mine and I'm going to save them. Not on who they are in themselves and what they did, because God loves them and God kept them, holding him to himself. He sent me to come to them. How can you not be thankful? How can we not? We must. Lord, we could be in dire misery at times, but we can be thankful. And the Apostle Paul, remember, writing this, he's in prison. And some commentators believe that he was chained to a guard at the time. And it does, it sounds like this man is so vibrant, so filled of God and love for God and Christ. Not as one who's chained there, knowing pretty soon he's going to go to death. Maybe having his head chopped off. But he's thankful what God is doing, even through him to write to the churches. You and I have much that we can be thankful for. Sometimes I look back at this life of mine and I say, oh, if God hadn't done anything, where would I be now? And in some cases I say, I would not be alive right now. I was a foolish young man, a stupid kid. Oh, and, and he had to be, God had to be watching over me. And even coming into grace, everything wasn't perfect at that point. And I, oh, how many times, God, please forgive me. But to know he does hear and he does give because of what Christ has done, not because of what I'm doing. Let us endeavor to pray in the way we ought to pray and to fix this line up unto all that we have in here. Paul is saying here that what we must do is devote ourselves to prayer. He doesn't like throw it up in the sky somewhere and say, now, try to catch something that I'm talking about to vote to. No, look back in the passage. Why be subject to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord? Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will lose heart. Slaves or servants, Make sure you obey those who are, are masters over you. Verse 1 in chapter 4, masters grant to your slaves or servants justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Paul is saying all of life 
should be prayed at. We should look at it. We should look at every relationship in the family and find ourselves praying. We should look at every relationship in the church to you, brethren, you and I, to close together and praying for God's mercy and grace. And this, this is enough to keep us praying, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We think about some of our lost relatives and we pray for them. We won't give up on them. Yes, we know God's going to save his own. But God didn't tell us that we can look at people and tell them if they are his own or not. So he told us, pray for sinners. Brethren, don't give up on anybody in your family yet. Keep praying. Pray God's mercy and grace to them. Augustus, Augustine, his mother prayed for him. He got to be an older man. Young, young man, probably in his 30s or so, and he went out there wild as can be. His mother's prayers were answered. And he became a mighty man for the church. We don't know yet what God's about to do. Even for those in our families who are unconverted, don't give them up. Continue to pray and plead to God for thanksgiving. I'm going to tell you something. I see things happening, and I believe it's not by chance. It's by God himself he's doing. And I see some things happen, and I say, as I look at my life, and probably you could say anything, look at you like, this thing came to birth because God was in it. Not that I was a, a Christian yet, but God was planning his way. You know, preparation of grace, as it's called, when you look at the life with Joseph, God was in it all the way. He didn't let it go so far because he had his hand on us. And each and every one of us, when we look at our lives, let us see what God has done through it. Look back on it. Look at our wickedness. Look at your own way you sinned and say, in the midst of that, God loved me and he saved me. If we are truly saved, we should be thankful. Because I tell you, my past and where I was, I should have been dead. But it's only to the truth that God and he saved. You could see what God was doing. Now we can't tell that, or our unconverted ones can't tell that right now looking at their life. They don't know that. We don't know it either. But dear people, plead for our loved ones. Pray that God would have mercy on them. And pray that God will save them. Let us do what Paul says. Let us endeavor to pray in the way taught in this passage, devoting ourselves to it, keeping alert in prayer, and praying with thanksgiving. Yeah. Let me say something too on the end. When we have a worship service and we pray, and at the end of prayer, a hearty amen should be given. I don't want to make anybody put anybody on the spot. But sometimes the amen is given and I hardly hear one or two voices. You know what the amen is saying at the end of a prayer? Thanks be to God. That's what it's saying. Let us pray. Oh, blessed God in heaven, we truly ask you to help us we see the truth of all this and we know how it works in it and should work in our lives. But Father, sometimes we fall short and we thank you that in that falling short, we could turn to you. And you would say, you have said you will never leave us nor forsake us. And so Father, we thank you. We will be those who will progress in this life because you brought us to yourself through this death of your son, Jesus Christ on the cross. And we are so thankful to what you've done for us, our God. And so we do, and we promise to serve you from this day on until you should call us into heaven. And we do ask you to hear and answer this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. 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 That's, that felt good, didn't it?